Hey, Marco. Hello. Hello, Michael. Hello, Terry. Hello. Mark's going to be back once he switches to his computer. He didn't like his iPad. Okay. Yeah. Nice view of my armpit. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have smell of vision, right? <laughs> right. We it's don't fine. want the internet to get that good. <laughs> <laughs> it's summertime, so okay. it's been in the 90s. I was just I spent the weekend in the mountains up in Granby with a bunch of um, um, uh, fr old friends uh, going back folks I volunteered with before I, I actually, uh, right. the I, I went to Nicaragua with, um, it was a, it was a wonderful time and I'm, I'm getting back into the swing of things now, but actually not completely because a couple of my friends are staying one, one stayed over ahead of a flight and then the other one is driving across the country. So he's hanging out for, a couple of days and I thought he might join us today, but he went out for a hike this morning and so he may not make it. His name is Herb. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know your mom was from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. My mom's from El Salvador and my dad from Italy and they met in New York <laughs> and they melted. <laughs> <laughs> the melting pot. Yeah. They melted right into the pot <laughs> and I bubbled out. <laughs> Hello, Ed. And we are missing a World Cup game uh, at this very moment: Colombia versus England, which would probably uh, be pretty will be an exciting game. I've, I've gotten to see a few of the games. I played soccer growing up, and my father is a, a soccer fanatic. Right. So he's and he's retired. So and. Watch, he's watching every single game. You know, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm missing that game. He's a bit of a curmudgeon, too, I, I should say. No, well, <laughs> we three soccer fans have that in common, <laughs> particularly when it comes to the Italian team. <laughs> they didn't even make it. This. My son is British. My son in law, who's British, is half Italian. He also has an Italian passport. So he's boycotting because the Italians aren't there. But now he has to watch because the Brits are playing Colombia. <laughs> yeah. Well, hope, hopefully this will be a, 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 a exciting match of our own. Uh, yeah. a match in a different yes. kind of sense. A matching of minds, maybe. Ah, there you go. Uh -huh. And uh, Doug, um, can we hear you? He's got some technical issues. He said he'll come back uh, when he's got a better connection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's got oh, he's on chat. Storms. 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 Okay. Terry? Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you. I'm glad you could make it. Yeah. This came together in a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> and we do have, the topic has switched probably three times in the last 24 hours. <laughs> so, More than that. So maybe we should... Just uh, confirm that we're all on the same page. <laughs> Sounds good. Derwin, would you like to oh. lead off? Yeah, I had, um, I guess I've been interested in a number of years, of being sort of engaged in the integral community one way or the other since about 2003. Um, and of course, we went through, a we've been through a number of um, controversial issues with teachers and controversies of surrounding teachers. and around uh, sexuality, and certainly it's there in a wider culture, at least in North America, maybe not so much in Europe, as Ed was saying. Um, and I was born and raised in a spiritual community, too, and many of the same issues. So um, it just seems to be one of those perennial kind of human challenges and opportunities. And so um, for a number of years, I've wanted to see something happen in an integral context either. And it just seemed to me at times, I thought, well, maybe a kind of an assessment would be a way to go in because it's such a charged topic. If we could just get some more objective sort of overview, at least of how people are thinking about this topic, maybe that would be a way to start. 
Um, yeah, and I tried to get something going a little bit ways back, and then there was some conflict, <laughs> uh, and that didn't happen. And and so, so yeah, so it's just um, to me, it's both exciting, a little feel some trepidation, but it's also exciting. Maybe have a chance to look at it again. Um, yeah, and I have a little bit of background as a couples therapist. I've done some couples therapy. Um, and I guess, you know, I uh, mean, a long-term relationship uh, for 20 plus years now. So, yeah. But other than that, I don't have any particular expertise, more of an interest. Um, I'm getting some background buzzing noise. I'm not sure whose mic it's coming from. So why don't we just keep ourselves on mute and kind of take turns? Um, okay. And- and uh, you wrote a, you know, you wrote a nice write-up, yeah, for this for this talk. Uh, would you mind going through it because I thought it was sure. really succinct and kind of would, okay, know, lay the groundwork for for a, a good conversation. Sure. Um, so, arguably, this is what I'm saying. Arguably, sexual repression in the U.S. creates conditions that contribute to the creation of the sexual predators we see in the news. Seeing that these conditions contribute to the occurrence of sexually predatory behavior in men, however, in no way condones that behavior. Those men, these men, are still responsible for their behavior, i.e. are needing to grow up. On the other hand, we saw in the Me Too movement some individuals, using the language of postmodernism, but without an ethics of inclusion, to punish men, usually, without due process. Seen as built-in features of the cosmos, integral theory includes as unavoidably present four noble qualities that are beauty, goodness, truth, and usefulness. Sex is clearly related to the attraction to beauty, with beauty inspiring creativity, passion, and right effort in others. In terms of the passion that is inspired, it is crucial to honor the boundaries set by the beautiful not for reasons of pre-modern ethics, but for the practical or modern reason that those boundaries are what create the container for the creative contribution itself. I would argue that honoring the boundaries of what we find to be beautiful and what inspires in us erotic feelings provides an inside out approach to sexual ethics. I would also argue and have support from Ken Wilber on this that it would be useful to apply the constructive developmental assessment understandings specifically to this area as a way to assist us in navigating these waters. In this cafe, we will begin discussing these these issues with input from our guest, Terry O'Fallon, PhD, who works in the area of developmental assessment. Thank you, Darwin. So um, I think we would need to understand what is meant by Maybe two things, a, a bit about the cultural climate that we're referring to, like the Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein, within um, specific yes. communities, you can identify different individuals or you know, different contra- you know, events, controversies, accusations. It's, kind, it's, in the, it's, it's, it's part of the zeitgeist right now. So this is part of the context for this conversation. Are on a live webinar right now. Part of the charge uh, of it, uh, I believe. Uh, it's it's a converse, It's a conversation that's happening in many many ways, in many many contexts, uh, with varying degrees of, we might say, clarity, effectiveness, depth, etc. Um, but what you're particularly proposing is that one way to gain some perspective on uh, this issue is through looking at it in, term, in developmental terms and then using the tools of developmental assessment to um, evaluate uh, what we're working with psychologically and culturally. And so Terry is um, a researcher and practitioner in uh, integral uh, developmental assessment. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to let you introduce yourself. Um, I know that you work with a model you call STAGES, or that's um, uh, uh, acronym, uh, has the acronym S-T-A-G-E-S. And 
I have not studied it. I have not worked with you in the past. So although I'm aware of it and I, I am aware of some of the, um, the work that you include in your model, like that of Suzanne Cook-Reuter, uh, other developmentalists, uh, I don't. I would. I think it would be really beneficial for the conversation for anybody watching or listening to this to just have an introduction uh, to yourself and, and what you do and what is meant by uh, development and how that might even be assessed. And I will unmute you. Uh, <laughs> there. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, I I have such a respect for it might help for me to to just give you a sense of the philosophy upon which the stages model is built. Um uh, I used both Suzanne's and Ken's model to put this stages model together. And um but the philosophy upon which it's built is that that um our minds, um, in order to understand things, we carve things up. And so uh, there's a, a massive wholeness in whole consciousness and that is, uh, you know, unbounded and is also uh, uh, timeless. And the only way, one of the ways that our minds understands things is to put things in categories. So what we do, in my opinion, with these developmental stages is to carve up consciousness, fence pieces off. Hopefully they fit well enough so we're not leaving pieces of consciousness out so that we can take a microscope to certain parts of it and get a better sense of, you know, when we put it all together, what what consciousness really is about. And then Gradually, we take the fences away, and we don't need those anymore for, for meaning-making. Um, not to say that that's a truth, but it's one way of looking at things. And uh, so it's important to understand that each developmental model has their own kind of um, philosophy upon which their model is built. I picked the two areas that I felt, uh, two uh, models that to me were very um, – uh, prominent. Uh, one of them was Suzanne's, uh, and uh, she has she to me is a pi absolute pioneer in her work, in that she took the Lovinger model and uh, she and Bill Torbert put it together uh, a whole big edition um, by uh, making it available not just as a research instrument but also as a way of measuring leadership and they added some new stems and did some really important work there. Suzanne went ahead after scoring thousands of inventories, went ahead and, and discovered the next two levels of development, the construct aware level and the unify, uni, unit, unitive level. Um, my work was built on hers in that well, I was a scorer for her for a long time and uh, uh, got to know the model, her model quite well. But to me, uh, you know, the underpinning of hers that she, she, she added person perspectives to her model so that uh, person perspectives were a part of it. But she didn't um, uh, include how to measure person perspectives in her scoring system. So that's what my model is about. And uh, so I leaned on Ken Wilber's four quadrants and his you know, he has his uh, integral math, which is the perspective, perspectival uh, process. He has a formula for it, actually. I used his formula to develop a way of working with these perspectives and, um, and put, put those two models together in a way that, that uh, we could try to measure what the perspectives were all about. The other thing that I did was I formulated a very strict measuring stick so that each perspective took up the same amount of space. You know, there's tons of research for babies, and you could probably find 25 or 30 or even 100 stages within just baby steps, the baby stages, because we've done so much research there. On the other hand, at the unitive level that Suzanne had, you know, four was the maximum that you could find because there just wasn't 
much, I mean, four, four categories because there just wasn't much material to work with. So when you work with a measuring stick, you have to make sure that the measuring stick has the same equal amount in each stage. So we did an early first person, a late first person, an early second, a late second. That was the concrete tier. That's where most of the objects in that tier are concrete. Then we went to what we call a subtle tier, and we don't want to get that mixed up with subtle states because it's a little different. It's the objects are subtle. So, for instance, judgments are subtle, assumptions are subtle, contexts are subtle, systems are subtle, that sort of stuff. You know, reasoning, those are all subtle things. And then the next four stages were um, early third, late third, early fourth, late fourth. And then we took the, the third octave, which is the meta-aware tier. And that's when uh, we're measuring aspects of, of uh, awareness. So we're working with emptiness and fullness in that tier. And so we have the construct aware, which is the, the 5.2. Oh, the fifth, early fifth, we have the late fifth, the early sixth, and the late sixth. So those three tiers were what our research was based on. The research was based on uh, uh, developing a scoring system that would measure those stages. And then uh, it wasn't a correlation, it was a, a, a replicative study which uh, in which there were three scores in the in Suzanne's uh, scale, the ego development scale, and four scores, four on her side and four on my side, on the stages new scoring system, and uh, so we did those scorings, and the research came out very very high. Uh, we did a kappa study with it. Uh, and uh, the Kappa study showed, uh, you know, in some of the of the uh, uh, ways of defining what is good and what isn't good, uh, it came out perfect in one. Of course, nothing is ever perfect, but statisticians like to think it is sometimes. You know? <laughs> and then it came out uh, in another in another uh, configuration. It came out excellent. So it was in the top categories for the whole scale. So. Um, with that, we started scoring with it, and uh, what we found is that the earlier four stages actually replicated at the second four stages, except that the objects were different. And then they replicated again in the top four. We could get these repeating patterns by keeping that measuring stick very, very strictly clear. So... Um, We've, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of, of uh, work with it and quite a bit of studying and quite a bit of research on it. We've done uh, uh, the, the – so what we do is we work with parameters for the, uh, for the person perspectives. And um, I'm not going to say anything more about this because, I mean, I could talk for hours on just, the, just that alone. But just to let you know that we, we really did try and have continued to do research to support it. It's a new scale, so, you know, it's probably not perfect. And, and uh, uh, I developed it so that it's evolutionary, so that the input that we get, instead of, of leaving uh, little, you know, things that don't fit in the scale aside, once we find something that doesn't fit in the scale, we are obligated to make the scale change so that we do include it. So it's constantly changing. Um, so it's evolutionary in that way. Uh, so that's a little bit about the stages model. And uh, because we, we score with parameters instead of just simple categories, uh, uh, we have a system that is more similar to the Electica scoring system. And then we're doing it with a system that is more like the ego development measurement now, how do we get, as you know, the ego development scale has a, has, is a sentence completion test. And the first thing that I did when, when we got the uh, resulting verification was to note, was to try and look at all of the stems that people would complete and say, what quadrant are these stems in? And we found that they, they were very heavy in the upper left and the lower left quadrants and very light in the upper right and lower right. So we reformulated and made some new stems and did consistency studies on those because we want people to have an opportunity to evoke the wholeness of that model that Ken has developed 
And uh, there are many models out there that are very, very good, but this particular one is good for development because it has development in all four areas, as you know. And so uh, we wanted to, to make sure that we had uh, an opportunity uh, for people to actually speak their truth into all four areas rather than be uh, pointed towards just one or two of those quadrants. So that's the second study that we did. And then um, as a result of that, uh, we were able to uh, start looking at, you know, uh, Bill Torbert and others have, uh, ours is a 36-sentence STEM uh, process. Bill Torbert's is, is at 30 stems. They've done as many as 48 stems. So you can alter the number of stems in your work. So what we did then when we decided we wanted to do specialty protocols, let's say that we wanted to do a specialty protocol on morals or on sexuality or on love, and we've got one on love. What we do is we work with somebody that has a very strong interest in that field and has a good background in that field. We have them take six of the stems out of the inventory that we already have and replace them or alter them with six of these of, that relate to that particular area, like an ethics one or a parenting one. We even have a Mormon one because we have people in the Mormon church that want to take the lid off. And so they want to see how, how are these people developing within their own faith. We have a, a, a loved one that, that has been. So we, we, run, we give them to a bunch of people and then we run consistency studies to make sure that we're still measuring ego development and perspectives, which is what the scale measures but that we can also have a window into the developmental levels that people have um, in these particular specialty areas. And we found them to be a gold mine because once we give them to 50, 100, 200 people, uh, what we're finding is that we can go back and, and locate all those stems and notice which one scored the early third, which ones and line all those completions up, line up all the completions that sign up at the uh, late third person perspective, line all the ones that come up at the early fourth person, the late fourth person, which is teal, the late early fifth person, which is construct aware, the late fifth person, which we call transpersonal, the early sixth person, which we called universal, or, and the, the, the late 6.5, which we call illumined. And we can, we can look then amongst all those stems to see how do people at the 3.0 or the expert level, how do, they, well, how do they talk about ethics or how do they talk about social, sexuality? What are their views on this? We can't measure sexuality in a, you know, in a skillful way. <laughs> very easily, but we can measure their attitudes and what they say about that. So we have all kinds of information, for instance, in the area of love, in the area of parenting, in the area of, of uh, we've got a psychology one, uh, we've got the, a general inventory, but uh, we've got one going on climate change right now. So we're starting to, to be able to pick out what are these developmental levels, what do people at these developmental levels say about this particular specialty topic. So we're finding some very, very interesting things about the attitudes of people when they express themselves at a particular developmental level towards a particular topic. So that's where my interest is in this uh, conversation that we're having now. I know that if you want to have the lectica, as you mentioned, Derwin, uh, if you want to have the Lectica build a scale for you, it, it, it gets very costly. But in this scale, since we're talking about the attitudes and not particular skills, but how, how do people view the, what is their perspective on this particular topic? All we need to do is find somebody that has a passion about it. They can come to us. We will help build that inventory. We give to enough people who are willing to volunteer to take it, uh, score them. Um, we don't provide comments or anything. We score them. Uh, and uh, then we send it off to our statistician to do consistency studies to make sure that we haven't obliterated our scale or that we haven't altered it so much that we aren't measuring uh, a perspective anymore. And then when we get those consistency studies, we offer that scale to the public. And uh, 
when we get enough of them, then we can start uh, gathering together these these different developmental uh, uh, attitudes and uh, perspectives on these specialty areas and find out a little bit more about how people at these developmental levels are going to uh, view these these areas. And that can be, in our view, a helpful way of, of looking at how we might be able to um, uh, support growth and development in those areas. We also um, do a lot of work with shadow, shadow crashes, and we can tell when, when people uh, uh, fall into shadow, oftentimes they fall into a er very early level of development, something that happened to them at a much younger level. We can see that in, in the ways that they express themselves sometimes in these inventories. And we know then that shadows also have their developmental level, and we can measure that with this. We can measure the developmental level of their shadow. And that helps us look at shadow elements as well. So anyway, um, all of these inventories and all of these models are all a specialty that works with a variety of different ways. And they're all wonderful in my view. And to me, none of them have... Uh, None of them have a full picture of a whole human being. And uh, to me, they're helpful tools. They aren't necessarily who a person is, but perhaps they can help us to have a, a, a wider view on the kind of uh, perspectives that people take on these in these various areas that we test. So I'll be quiet now and let you uh, ask questions or we can get on with the topic of our discussion. I, I would like to just to maybe help translate some terms um, because uh, I, I, I don't know if everybody has the same um, you know, background in terms of the reading or study. Uh, and you referred earlier to uh, Wilbur's integral calculus uh, of mm -hmm. perspectives, which has a particular notation. As far as I'm aware, that material is mostly concentrated in at least where I first saw it, on, I don't know if it's been republished, but in excerpts that were published online in PDF format back in like 2000, uh, and were meant to be part of and meant to be part of a volume two of his. Actually, he has it in his Integral Spirituality book. He has oh. the yes okay. that it relates to the zones actually. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, but the 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 perspectives go from they follow the natural perspectives in language so yes. when i say i that's a first person perspective you is a second person perspective we is a first person plural perspective but in the way wilbur uses it uh the we is the third the three p i believe in his calculus um but if i understand you correctly the way the measure that you're actually using to determine whether a sentence uh, is at one level or another, is is how it exhibits these perspectives, which can be calculated in a sense. Yeah. Can you say more about that, how that works? And, and only because first, second, third are um, relatively well-known, uh, but fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, don't, don't, are not part of natural language. We, in grammar doesn't have a fourth or fifth or sixth person perspective. Uh, or at least I don't know what the, what the pronoun for it would be. Well, it does for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then. Let me, let me just show you a little, a little uh, graph here that might make it a little more clear. And I, uh, maybe it'll, it'll help. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, can you see that? Can you see that, Michael? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. So we ask only three questions, and it helps us get to the, to the... So you can see this is a matrix, and it's not a stair step. And that's the first thing that we want to do. We, we work with, work, work with ver verticality and horizontally and actually diagonally, too. But it's, it's more like blowing up a balloon than it is climbing a set of stairs, you know. So, so this is, column is the person perspective. And um, um, this column is the tier that I talked about, the concrete tier, 
then we have the subtle tier, and then we have the meta-aware tier. And then this column is, uh, you know, the top of the quadrants is in, you're either an individual or you're in a collective, and th that pattern repeats. You're individual and collective in the concrete tier. Then you'd have an individual preference, and then you have a collective preference in the, in the subtle tier, and then you have an individual and collective preference in the meta-aware tier. Then we have this learning pattern, and this learning pattern relates very much to, to uh, the trajectory of, of how we grow up. And if any of you have ever had babies, you know, the first thing they do is, is they, they just laying there and they receive everything through their senses. Then you know about the terrible twos. They become pretty active and they start using those senses with everything that they do. The next thing they do is find a friend and they feel they, they're in reciprocity with their friend. And the last thing they do is that they, they start standing on a set of principles that are so interpenetrated that they will live on those principles if they lose their life. And that's the, 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 uh, the uh, 2.5 or the conformist or uh, uh, some people call it amber, some people call it blue if you want to put a color in it. And then it starts all over again here, but instead of being receptive at the concrete level, they're receptive at the subtle level, active, reciprocal, interpenetrative. Then, then they move into being receptive, active, reciprocal, and interpenetrative at the meta-aware level. So you can see this gives us different kinds of parameters. So at 1.0, we're looking for, are they have, talking about concrete objects? Is it all about me? I'm an individual. And is it about receptive? If so, then they're going to be in the early first person or a more of an impulsive place. Whereas if they're at 3.5, uh, they will be using subtle objects like reasoning and that sort of thing, uh, thinking about their thinking, thinking about their feeling and that sort of thing. But it's still all about me. Uh, they have goals and objectives and they're, they're uh, heading out for what they want. And they're very active oriented. And that's what we know is, is the achiever. Then when we get in, and I'll do another one. So you can see each one of these, even though the parameters are, are repeating patterns, when they come together, uh, they have this capacity to, to identify the, the uh, parameters of a perspective. So when we get to the, let's say, the 6.0 uh, up in the MetaWare tier, they have MetaWare objects. In other words, they're aware that they're aware. Uh, they have a collective presentation. Um, they, they don't think so much in terms of, of context anymore. They think of the, of the whole, whole universe and the ocean of awareness. And then they're in reciprocity with that. And we call that the universal stage. So we use these patterns to score with, and we ask the first question, what is the object? And you figure out, is the object concrete? Is it subtle? Is it meta-aware? The next one is, do people lean towards an, an individual or a collective? Uh, and we find that people are, you know, at every tier, there's a, a couple of stages where it's really all about me, and a couple of stages where it's really more about the collective preference that people have. And then people tend to go through this, this uh, approach as they move through the learning sequence pattern. And so this is just a very brief summary of what, what we go through and, uh, you know, to determine the person perspectives at each particular level of development. And um, um, so the person perspectives, uh, you know, when we started working with the person perspectives, a third person perspective is is all people got to, and it, it went up through 3.5, which is a late third-person perspective. But 4.0 is pluralistic, and that's a brand new level, really, in, in humanity. And so people don't, they, they know that they aren't, uh, uh, they know that they're not the same as the third-person perspectives. They're not achieverish, you know, but, but they don't, um, they haven't named it necessarily to, to move on, you know. And so, you know, we found that there are perspectives all the way up through 6.5. Now, Suzanne was the one that first said, we've gotten perspectives past 3.5. We've got, uh, and she, she named them more, uh, you know, in, uh, with names and colors, mostly with names. We've made ours into numbers so that we can be more precise about, about it. And it also, we don't use colors because if you look at color psychology, you know, that, that will affect you. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, if, if, if you have 
if the integral community has an aversion to green and you have a green label on you, then anytime you see the color green, you won't wear green. You won't. You don't want anybody to know you're green. You know, it, <laughs> colors are not necessarily <laughs> the best thing in the world when you're uh, for all instances. So we feel like these are a little bit more neutral uh, down here, and so we've just continued to build. And Suzanne got up through what is our 5.5, and then we moved on into the 6.0 and 6.5 uh, with just two new, uh, two additional levels of development. And so um, uh, another way of looking at this is that there's a first person and a second person concrete at this tier. There's a first person and second person subtle in this tier, and there's a first person and second person meta-aware in the later tier. So there's lots of ways to look at person perspectives, but most people think only of first, second, and third because that's really what we've had, you know, eons of time that have, um, where people have actually um, uh, used those perspectives not knowing that there was anything any later than that until, you know, the 60s or so when a fourth person perspective became prominent. Hmm. Wow. Does that make sense? have any sense to it at all for any of you? I mean, I, I mean, yeah, it's really interesting for me. Um, did you, anyone else want to say something at this point or I, 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 I think let's, to- let's go ahead and move on Dur- Derwin and maybe, you know, let, uh, as, as you yeah. develop the top, you know, the, the, the application right, right. of this okay. potentially, uh, we could start, we can kind of circle back and integrate uh, what uh, Terry has shared. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that's coming up that's a little bit off topic, it's off the topic of sexuality, but it's related to stages more generally in terms of what I've seen out there that's where I think the objection to stage models is coming from is being basically the political implications of that. So, so, um, you know, basically that if you have a stage model, that you're going to end up with fascism, that people are going to take a stage model of individual development and apply it to a political ideology that will result in, um, other people having less power than they, than they do now. Um, and and yet, like where I'm seeing it, Ken, at least in Ken's most recent writing in Crowdocracy, in the forward to that, he's he says no. If you look at evolution, it tends to go the other way. In each new era, the, the every person gets more control over their life, not less. So, like democracy compared to monarchy is actually a lot more. It's <laughs> at least if it's working properly, it's a lot more than in monarchy. And monarchy presumably is better than, you know, warlord uh, times. Um, so, so I think as long as we're clear about the political, uh, what we intend to do politically with this understanding <laughs> of development, then I think that would help um, allay some of the uh, some of the concerns that people have, um, but not to underestimate you know, the places where you'll find those concerns, like this was going back a few years and maybe he's changed his perspective now, but I recall doing an interview with uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, who's very prominent in developmental world. And he was pretty clear that, you know, that constructive developmental was not a good way to, to look at uh, development. Um, Now that was, you know, eight years ago, maybe his changed his perspective. I don't know, but but that's, you know, that's was certainly out there at that time when I was in graduate school. Uh, so just that's just a little, I guess that's a personal statement about why I think these models can bring up so much resistance. Um, I'm really aware, too, that, that uh, at least in our model, uh, every other stage will love the developmental model and every other stage will not like it. So it's like 
this huh. stage will love it. And then the very next stage that they get into, they'll start seeing things, but they see things horizontally and they haven't made categories enough to really, and the mind will continue to make categories. I've never seen anybody that doesn't have a category. How, how would we even get out of bed and make breakfast in the morning without, you know, knowing where things are stored in the kitchen? So the mind has this capacity to make categories. And once we see that, we can watch how the categories just start forming. But every other stage, you know, they're busy horizontally working with the greatness of the new, new perspective there is. And then when they get that, then they want to want to go with it again. So it's like a rocking chair. And I call, I call it God's rocking chair because it's perfect to have people not like development. And it's also perfect that they do like development, in my view. <laughs> That's what makes us grow up is by having this, this beautiful rocking chair and the capacity to see things a new way. So you're noticing a pattern even when people get to quotes, uh, I guess, what would that be, five or four or, some, or four? Every stage, all the way up. All alternates. That's interesting. All the way up and all the way down. That's what our research is showing. <laughs> well, well I, I think you were very careful, too, to um, delimit uh, the demand of what you're actually looking at in the research. It's, it's not what people do. It's how people talk. It's what they believe, yeah. It's their worldview, their perspective. Yeah, that's based right. Based on what they say or based on what they would say in, the, to, in response to these themselves. So it's a, it's a window into the mind. Um, that's right. But it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily predictive about how any given individual will behave. That's right. Uh, so I found that reassuring um, because uh, I like having windows. I like having perspectives. Uh, but as someone who may be slightly anti-developmental map in my particular meaning making, you know, in at the level that I'm at um, or exhibiting, um, <laughs> I, 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 I that that lets me know um, that. You, you're not a fascist, basically. You're not going to try to box me in to one particular, uh, you know, level or person perspective or, or another, um, because that's sometimes how I've seen these types of systems used as um, they're kind of weaponized, if you will, in the yeah. sort of culture yeah. wars at this level and meta-aware levels. But let me show you a little bit, just one thing relating to predators, uh, that that uh, this kind of, uh, of an approach can weigh in on. Uh, my brother is a psychotherapist, and he, uh, he uh, took some time to really work with, with predators. Um, and he, had, he was reluctant to because he wasn't sure he could even be objective. He had such bad feelings about that kind of behavior, you know. It was just... So he decided he would clear his mind and just listen to what people said. And uh, he was, uh, you know, had, had enough background and experience that he, he understood some developmental things. What he found was that we tend to box predators all into one place. When they aren't all, he found a, a whole lot of predators who were people who had a grown-up body and they could, you know, uh, work and do the different kinds of things that, that people do, but that their developmental level in their mind was this, the same level as a child's when it came to this. And so uh, they, would, they, would, they couldn't find anybody else necessarily that, that they felt like they resonated with, and they would actually see a child and fall in love with them. And they would, you know, and they thought the child was asking them to, to pay attention to them. They thought the child loved them. They were absolutely aghast when the, they had the understanding that this, they didn't want anything that, you know, that they were in trouble for it and because they thought that, that they had a real heart connection. And then they would, of course, try and pursue them. So they would call him, you know, predators. Uh, and so what he was able to do was help them find a partner their own age that had the same kind of mindset. Oh, wow. and they were happy. That's very smart. You know, and, and they never did it again as long as they had, I mean, they want to love too, just like everybody else, but nobody would love them back at the, at the level of the perspective they were taking, nobody. And so this was one of the things that he found. And so he started saying, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of predators here and we can't 
put them all in the same category. So we categorize whether or not it's developmental. We tend to build a category around a topic like this and say they're all bad when some of them, I mean, if you look at it from that perspective, they're maybe not as bad as we think they are. We don't condone it, you know, but but there maybe there are ways that we can work around it that are a little bit different and that maybe these people's attitudes aren't nearly as as perverse as some people's are. So just offering that when it comes to categorizing, there's lots of ways that we judge people. Yeah, so you actually use the development, you use some assessment with the clients? He he has learned to do this, uh, this uh, developmental assessment uh, in, in the office in the moment so that he can see what level they're at. And then he has developed interventions that fit that level of development. So if their shadow is is down in the basement, 1.5 1, 1. or red or whatever you want to call it, he has to use a different develop and in even other parts of them might be in different areas but you know he has to use an intervention when they're in that state that ego state that is at an earlier level of uh intervention because they you can't reason with people that are at that level of development normally so right so these are the kinds of things that we we do with this we distinguish between parts of of people so that we can help them grow up in the areas and be more, ba- ours is more about balancing, not about, what we find is that when people become very healthy at the level of development that they're at, they naturally float to the neck. We don't ever try to make anybody develop. <laughs> Some of those beautiful people on the face of this earth are at an early level of development, uh, uh, you know, so uh, it's not necessary to grow up to be uh, a really be- a very beautiful person, but healthy is important. And that's what our model is more about. And when they get really healthy, they usually just float to the next level all by themselves. Uh, can I say something? Happy. Yes, Michael. Uh, hey, uh, I'm coming from a place probably that's less academic than all of you, but I am a voracious reader and have it, have come across a lot of these ideas and read Wilbur and as I'm listening to you, my um, um, inner uh, reaction is this notion of power, and I will define it for myself, of the ability to take action and having to move through your working model of what that means to me and how I interact with other people. I see power more as I like to use it more as understanding the ability I have rather than the political baggage it puts on it, even though you can't get out of that. That's part of the rhetoric. And I guess, I guess my question just popping into my mind, it just seems like culturally, if we listen to the rhetoric of politics and power, where would you put it on your developmental level? Well, power is something that starts right away when at the terrible two. You know yes, that. Right. And, right. What kind, and what kind of power do they have? They have social power. Susie's mom said that, I, that she could do it. Mm-hmm. We have emotional power. <laughs> you know, where, you, you know, you're trying to get, get your, you look to see if your parent is going to respond to you. You have physical power. You sock your, your, hit your parent and you have intellectual power, you know, where you try and argue your way out of it and reason your way out of it. And the thing is, is that those four kinds of power are really, really strong and they will learn those powers right down there at red or at this 1.5 terrible twos level. And if it doesn't grow up, you end up being a narcissist. Right. That's, that's what happens. If you, so your power level can be at the level of this early, early level. And some of the rest of you can grow up, but that stays in the basement. And so when you talk about power, you have to look at what level of development are they at with those powers. Now, when people who develop power really, really well, and in a, in a beneficial way, they never use power for themselves. They use power to empower. They use social power to 
they give it away. And it always comes back. They use emotional power to empower. They, they use these not as something for them. They, they use it for other people. It's a gift to be able to use power in those ways. And that, that shows that their power has grown up. So there isn't just one kind of political power. There's, there's power all the way from this narcissistic power all the way up to, the, to, you know, to God. Yeah, uh, so, I, I, what, yeah, and I, I like the way you put it. I do, and I resonate with it. I'm constantly, the, the picture for me or the map that's always worked for me with the tension of evolving my power is I'm small, they're big. And the, because it fits in with like re, reoccurring pattern of going back to the terrible twos each time I've had to grow up to a different level is I'm small, something's bigger than me, whatever the fuck it is. You know, it's just that feeling and trying to negotiate that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you start recognizing that it's not all about you. Yeah, and right. Is- helping other people and that's right, where we right. flip there and that happens uh oftentimes people start getting that a little more automatically at the fourth person perspective the the pluralist level people start recognizing that a lot there and of course you get that all the way up and down people can mature in their power at a very i mean let's look at uh, saint Ter- sister Teresa, you know uh uh you know, there's so many people in the world that are probably conformist. Many monks are, and they're filled with compassion. They give all their power to people. So it's not exclusive for later levels, but uh, you tend to it will tend to, to start showing up at 4.0 if it hasn't shown up before then. And heavenly days, we hope it does show up before well, then. Well, my, my flip really took place, if say it that way, flipped when I had children. I had yeah. to think larger than myself. <laughs> And try to balance out, balance that out of thinking larger than myself, but as, at the same time, take care of myself, you know? Yes, that's a perfect example. I think most of us get there when we start having our kids. Yeah, thank you. And I would say related to sexuality and uh uh, to me, um, just like this power issue that you just talked about, Michael, sexuality uh, isn't all by itself. To me, it's coupled with with ethics and morality. Um, so, so I, sometimes you you have one particular area, but it's vastly affected by by your morality and your ethical life and the and the the, the way you see those things playing out so what sexual objects are we talking about because if we have concrete subtle and then metaware objects uh how do we kind of map out what i think derwin wants to talk about which is men acting in predatory ways and then the consequences of that and how as a society and as communities we we respond well, I'm also interested in why are not women included in this? Well, and and on that, then I was thinking just, yeah, you mentioned the narcissism where that shows up. So, yeah. so what you see, and I would say the shadow side of postmodernism as a general pattern would be uh, borderline. So a bo- borderline worldview, borderline kind of behaviors. I'm certainly working in the mental health field, you know, I worked three months at um, university setting, you know, one person who's one client who's so quotes borderline can take, you know, 12 staff people for an hour and a half talking about that client. Like it'll just, you know, they'll take like 60% of the resources (laughs) and it would be the same for narcissism, but the narcissists don't come for therapy. And shit, right? They don't come, the narcissists don't come for therapy until they get in trouble with the law, usually, yeah. right? Or or maybe their partner's leaving them. Yeah. Borderlines will be coming all the time yeah. for help. And so, um, and they need it. It's got to, you know, they're, they're coming, they need help. Um, so I would just, in terms of your model, how do you, how, have you noticed any patterns that where you would say in the developmental process that 
people who we might say have borderline characteristics. And I realize that's a little bit of a charged label. Like we can also say complex trauma. Yeah. Um, same for that. Yeah. A lot, of these, a lot of these are not just trauma, but people do not, don't recognize that the kind of parenting you do actually can, and the, the context that you put our children in actually build this. For instance, uh, if you have a pluralist parent and, and they want everybody to be absolutely equal, so the child gets to help them pick the house they're going to live in. The child gets to pick the car, help have a vote in that. Gets to have a you know, and that they're treated as equal to the parents in the way that that. Uh, uh, and then they they are not disciplined. Uh, this is an extreme thing. You know, not all pluralists are like this, but we see this wow. sometimes. Then when you have the ordinary little child who is at the terrible twos and they don't get any discipline, what do they learn? These, they learn these four powers and they learn it's all about me and they outdo their parents. And they actually t- grow up as a narcissist because the parents don't know how to set the boundaries. And in our society, we need collective boundaries or else people you know, don't get along very well. So uh, there's a parenting style for each developmental level, each adult is develop- developmental level, and, and finding a way to help them adapt their parenting style to the level of development of their child is really an important thing. So you run into those kinds of things, too. Uh, it isn't just trauma. Sometimes it's just not knowing how to set a context up for a particular developmental level, and then they just, you know, they need they need help growing up and they, they aren't going to do it by themselves very well. So we create them. We create the problems that we see at times by, uh, I mean, uh, I wouldn't call it neglect, but our very best wishes, our very best open heart is, is in, in effect trying to help them and be all they can be by gets, not setting a lot of limits. And then we don't realize the damage that can cause for them too. Sure. I mean, uh, we learned that, um, I guess the kids at my, at, at the school were choosing their own awards, apparently. I'm not entirely clear whether they got to just say what awards they wanted or whether that it was actually definitive. Like if they said, I want this award, they actually got it. Um, but we were a little surprised. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty flatland. <laughs> Also in schools, they they oftentimes have the children help make up their own rules, and that's really good when they get to a certain level of development. But, you know, when I was an elementary school teacher and I was asked to help have the children set up their own rules, I mean, they would they would make the most terrible rules like, uh, yeah, you know, if, if you drop a pencil on the floor, then you have to sit in the corner for two hours and miss three recesses. And then, then the next person would say, yeah, and if you sock somebody in the eye, you have to, you have to sit in the corner for two hours and, and you lose two or three recesses. All the consequences were the same because they haven't learned to prioritize yet, <laughs> you know. And so, so, you know, they have to learn how to, how to build these categories and learn that one offense is really worse than another offense, and you have to match the offense with the with the consequence. And, and they don't know how to do that yet, and yet we're trying to ask them to 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 you know to put these things together when they aren't ready yet. A first and second grader has a terrible time doing that, and even right on up into junior high, they have a terrible time doing that oftentimes. So these are the, this this stage that I was talking about, this early second person perspective, is one that doesn't understand hierarchy, and they don't understand a hierarchy of rules or consequences, and so they get themselves into trouble all the time. And it's a non-hierarchical stage. It's a stage where they're learning to categorize, but they haven't been able to do it, do it yet. That that's what they're learning. So when I was saying, you know. Uh, uh, a stage that that uh, you know is action oriented and and likes development. Then you have a stage that's horizontal. That's the kind of trouble the non horizontal stages get into. This, the vertical stages get into trouble because they think everybody should be like they are, and they keep t- trying to change everybody. You know, you need to be like me. That's the problems that they get into. So you know, it's just <laughs> and. It's just the way our scale is. Not every scale goes that way, but that's what we found in our research. So, Can I ask a question? Um, 
about that. Uh huh. You said that when you were uh, an elementary school teacher, children mm -hmm. would make rules that were just impossible. So you obviously didn't allow that. No, I certainly didn't. <laughs> you certainly didn't. But I got the impression from what you said after that, the teachers these days are allowing that. Sometimes they do. So, so why, why did they do that? Because they're in another hierarchical stage. It's an octave higher. They're at yeah, 4.0. Yeah, you're, you're arguing. Yeah, you're telling me that from where you're coming from, but you're not telling me why they're doing that. Because if they're the teachers, why don't they, if they don't know that they're the adults in the room, then well, we have they, a much bigger problem than your scale is going to reflect. Uh, the, the, they oftentimes those teachers are at the 4.0 level. It's an upshift from the two point level, and they are the adult in the room. But their view is that that we should not we should allow children to have as much space and to grow up and develop into these beautiful. And they don't want to interfere with their growth and development. They don't understand the limits. Yes, that, and where's that? Where's that? Com where's that coming from? That's why, why is it that way? That's because that way. Uh, Why is it that way? Because obviously there's a problem. It's, but yeah, it's their belief system. Like you have a belief system and, and you believe that it's a problem. They have a belief system. They don't believe it's a problem. Okay. But so they will act according to their belief system and you will act according to yours. Right. So, so my question difference. is then, how do we change that? Um, uh, you... Uh, if you have a school rife with that kind of, of uh, problem, hopefully you have an administrator that says, these are the school rules. <laughs> and you, you will help shape, shape things so that um, they, there will be a minimum uh, set of rules that, where content has to be a certain way. And then within those, that basic process, uh, and there usually deals with uh, ethical, moral, you know, like you're not going to mm -hmm. hit anybody, you're not going to, uh, you know, the various kinds of, and then within that, uh, that structure, uh, other kinds of rules can be built. It'll be okay if they, if children are given some, some uh, room to breathe. I mean, the opposite of that is having somebody at the conformist level where children have to sit in the desk with their feet on the floor, and if they breathe the wrong thing, they end up in the corner, you know. Or if they, you know, that's not good either. So what we need to do is find a, uh, and I grew up in a school like that. So, uh, so uh, you know, they both of these have aspects of, they both have aspects that are, are uh, you know could be damaging to a child. So the thing is, is to bring both of them together, and hopefully you have a, a, a somebody in the system that's wise enough, a principal. So that didn't happen in the school I was a principal of. And I have to say, we're getting off the topic here now of sexuality. I don't want to, you know, and I don't want to. Well, not completely. I mean, I, I think there can be there's a link because let's just take that a thought experiment. Okay. You, you have children making their own rules. Uh, now, you could have an administrator that imposes rules on the teachers, but what if the administrator lets the teachers make their own rules? So you always need one level above yeah. to, uh, if not impose, set the parameters or set things yeah. up for the, for the level before it. That's and, right. I mean, if we look at social structures and institutions, would it be fair to say that we, there's a failure of leadership, a failure of the higher levels to organize things well enough that the lower levels, and I'm speaking very crudely here, are yes. able to grow uh, in a healthy manner. Oftentimes that does happen. Uh, uh, the uh, 4.5 or teal level is really good at integrating all of that. And if you are blessed to have a, a, a somebody that is at that level uh, in prison or in a school or any place, they start having a wisdom that, you know, they have the, the opportunity, the, the capacity to focus in and see what the, first of all, they can zoom way out and they can see the whole system and they can see where the problems are in the system by zooming out. Just by looking at it, they can see this system 
uh, presents a container where something is going to go wrong over here, wrong over here. So then they can zoom in and they can fix that. Then they can zoom out and watch to see how everybody is responding. Then they can zoom in and stand inside of the system and feel, does this system make me change too? Do I feel differently in this system than I did before I made the change? So they test it on their own bodies and their own selves. And, uh, and this capacity to zoom in and out and then to, to, to create systems that gradually change. If you create a system that changes all at once, 30% of your people are going to bail because they can't stand an all at once change. And there are lots of very valuable people in those systems, even if they are at earlier developmental levels. So you want to keep those people. They're high morals. They're, they're dedicated to hardworking people. And, yes, there may be a clash of values and views. But, but nonetheless, they really are of great, great value to the system. So you, what you want to do is make sure that the system itself, you know, uh, just makes a gradual change, you know, a, a very gradual change along the way so that you don't scare people to death and allow allow that system to gradually remove the ceiling so that when you have people who, who are healthy and just want to float to a next level of development, they can, but you don't scare the people who aren't to death because this has been a gradual change. Uh, you know, you can do quick change if you want to, but you have to be prepared for what you're going to lose if you want to do that. If you do gradual change, then it may take longer than you want to take. So you, you have to weigh all of those things in the balance and see what, what you want to do. So the teal level can do that. Um, the um, the 4.0 level has a capacity, the pluralist uh, some people call it green level. Healthy green is a beautiful, beautiful stage because they're in reciprocity. And so they can keep things level. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes they can run into, in, into some problems because they're a non-hierarchical stage. The thing about the interpenetrative stages is that they, they, they work on principles. So they're both receptive and active. They, they, they have both, they, they've got both of those. They're very uh, capable of seeing both uh, the horizontal and the vertical and how important it is to balance those. So, I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody. Makes sense to me. Are you some? Are you talking? i some. Um, A C H R O N O N. I don't know how to pronounce your name, <laughs> but you're on mute. Yes, I couldn't hear you. I, I, I'm just, I'm Ed. Um, the acronym's, uh, acronym's just a handle. Um, I'm, I wasn't talking. I was simply blowing bubbles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, 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 my problem, my issue is I don't know anything about um, quadrants and colors and lines and levels. And I, I was a teacher in a private school for eight years. And oh, wow. But originally trained to be a teacher and um, never did much teaching in my entire life. And and I have a, a three-year-old grandson who's going to go to school in a couple of years here in Germany. And so I'm very interested in about, about well, how we can, or any, anyone can look at um, where, where people are and what they're doing and how, how systems work and what they're put together. And so a lot of this conversation this evening, this isn't a criticism, this is an observation from my perspective, is I feel like Charlie Brown when the adults are speaking, because there's, there's a lot of words being said, and there's a lot of things being said, but there are a lot of references being made that I can't relate to, and that's right. why when, when you said something very practical about, well, somebody has to be the adult and set the limits, that makes sense to me. But whether that's teal or rosé or four or six or whatever, I could I could care less because yeah. that doesn't mean anything. To me. Yeah, I understand. That, that's the point. That's where I'm looking for the the relationship of us. But I'm looking for something practical that I can use in my everyday life. Now, I certainly appreciate the the amount of uh, work and detail that you put in to developing this model that could 
inform people who are coming from that perspective and will understand what you're saying, how that helps. But I it, don't take it don't take it as a criticism, but I'd like to hear this in plain English <laughs> so that I kind of know what can I do with this when I'm dealing with my grandson? What can I do with this when I'm dealing with the neighbors next door? You know, that's that's always where I'm coming from. And that's why I was just blowing bubbles at the time. So I wasn't going to say anything. Just <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I understand. We do get into this lingo sometimes, and that's not at all helpful. Uh, you know, uh, the only answer I have to, to, to your question is to, is to maybe start looking at the characteristics of each of these developmental levels and notice whether people in the system are like one or more of, the, of those levels. And you'll have a... Uh, a good idea of where they're at. The system itself has a level of development in, you know, you can find a level of development of the system. So, um, and I, I look at systems and uh, you can look at all of their papers and their mi- visions and their mission and, and you can kind of tell what developmental level they're coming from as an organization. So, but I don't want to talk over anybody's head. So uh, perhaps some of you, you all know each other. I don't know any of you. So and Marco and Derwin, I know a little bit. So, you know, maybe you can translate a little bit when I'm going over the top with this stuff. And actually, maybe we ought to get into, you know, the other conversation that we were supposed to go into rather than just the developmental aspects of this. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I um, I guess one thing that's come up, and I'm thinking somehow this would relate to the sexuality and gender in the sense that um, something like there's a there's a, a field effect or a transmission or a sense of flow, and Johnny's not here, but he's often very tuned into that, and maybe others are as well. And then there's the cognition and what, um, how we're interpreting that. And so for me, it's how to bring those together. And in some way, that's connected to this issue of sexuality as well. Um, so that, <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of what I'm trying to get at. How can we feel the flow of the field effect or whatever context we're in and then have our cognition match that, integrate with it, not be um, just either dissociative or, or uh, otherwise unhelpful. Um, and I suppose it relates to the larger question about sexual ethics in that probably, I'm just hypothesizing that when there is a breach that way, there's usually some kind of either dissociation going on in the person or there's, a, I guess, a hidden addiction. Um, as well, uh, which would be a little bit different. So, I don't know. I'm out of my well, edge here. So. Well, D- Derman, I would say, I mean, th- th- there's a really direct connection between um, what Terry is saying, and in particular, this last point about the setting of limits and what you wrote and right. um, recited okay. at the beginning of this talk. But what I found most, um, what, what stood out for me the most, and not just because you bolded it, um, is that the the reason for the limits it changes when from a when you when you go in this developmental sequence from a egocentric to a modern or postmodern or integral I don't want to you know, end of jargon uh, point of view uh, and it goes just from setting limits in from a punitive in a punitive way or in a fearful way to setting limits because the limits enable a creative contribution. That's what you said. Uh, also, that, that that creative contribution is connected to a primordial aspect of the cosmos, which is beauty. And that you're drawing on Wilbur there, but also on Plato. Yeah, Plato. <laughs> and Habermas, too. <laughs> right. So the, you know, why, why is it important in social relations to set limits, it's not control for the sake of control. It's control so that something better, something more beautiful, something more true can come forth. We create the space for it, right? If, there is, if you have a work environment where there's intimidation, where there's fear, where there's distrust, etc., 
it's going to be hard to get great things done in that environment, right? So maybe you'll get certain kinds of movies done that can make, you know, millions of dollars because you're able to establish a, a you know, a hierarchy of, of fame and of power and get things done. But in the, what, what really is happening on the larger scale is, you know, you're creating some entertainment for people, but you're also making a lot of people really miserable because everybody who works on that movie or everybody who participates in that atmosphere is being degraded by it, right? So, I mean, I, I find that that changes the conversation because it, what I would, the question I would ask is, what do we want to do? What do we want to create? And if, if we can envision something that's better than the conditions which we are currently living with, and then we could map a way to get there. But that map would mean, you know, a, ma- a, a path is, is, means you're ruling out every other way. You know? So a map is a, a way, a path is a way of delimiting. Um, to me, it's, it's very simple, <laughs> I, I, I think. But maybe I could tell a story. <clears throat> um, so when I was a kid, little boy, uh, how old? Second, first grade, second grade. I had a crush on one of the girls in my classroom. I won't say her name. <laughs> I had a crush on two of the girls in my classroom. <laughs> and, but it was, you know, what Terry was saying earlier, it, it, for me, as a little boy, I was ever a little romantic boy. <laughs> you know, I didn't, it was not sexual in the sense of, I had no idea what secondary sexual characteristics were. It was emotional. And it was because these girls were pretty. They were full of life. They were, you know, they were wonderful little girls, right? I got in trouble once because we were playing in my, my friend, my friend's backyard. And we were kind of playing rough. Like it just turned rough. There were a couple of girls over and we were playing, and suddenly we were, like, on top of them. We weren't trying to do anything sexual, exactly, because I didn't know what that was. I didn't know, you know, the, that, how that worked. But it was um, a kind of violent act. It was a kind of predatory act it, from a, in, in, a, in a way. And it was also boys being boys. And it was also kids playing. And they were there playing with us. But you know, somebody saw that, an adult saw that, and told me not to do it, uh, and made me feel bad for doing it. And I, you know, I grew up, and um, I never committed any kind of terrible act, you know? I, I think I've taken a kind of decent path. Not a perfect path, but a decent path. Now, I have a wife, and I have two daughters. And I get to be, I get to have that emotional relationship with my daughters that I couldn't have because the girls didn't, you know, they didn't want to be my girlfriend or something. Like it was, it, I never could express, I never could, you know, become friends with them or something. Like something didn't like work, right? Uh, it was a crush, an unfulfilled longing. But the fact now that I can have a family and that we can have a container means that that little boy in me has a playmate. Uh, and I'm also a dad and a, a parent, and I have to protect them and kind of provide that container for them to grow up and, you know, not get into, into trouble, not be the object of a predator, uh, and, you know, fulfill their potential, become the people that, the beautiful people that, that they are and, and, and will become. So, I mean, to me, that's a perfect lesson. Uh, and I'm just thinking of it now. It's just occurring to me now by, you know, reflecting on the conversation here that I kind of ultimately got what I wanted. But I would never have that if I didn't have the trust of my wife and the, you know, the kind of if the, the ability to create some kind of container for it. And then that's going to pass. And the girls are going to grow up and we're going to always have that dimension of relationship, but the, the quality and the beauty of the relationship, the, you know, only becomes possible if there is, if there are those limits. Uh, now, 
you know, we're, I think culturally, socioculturally, we live in a world where a lot of people have not been protected in the ways that they needed to be, especially as children. And then they grow up to become adults. And I don't, you know, you can, I'm sure, analyze this according to all the different stages and where things get stuck in their, in their growing up. But it's such a mess. I mean, you know, I think it's playing out at the highest levels of power now. Right? Uh, and it's become a kind of theater of a, a tragedy, truly. Um, that if we can't absorb, if we can't learn from what is being shared and what's going on, and we can't um, mediate it in some way, uh, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I alternate between optimistic and pessimistic, um, just because you know I, I know how humans are, and I know how, I, I know how deep the karma is, um, but I, I think that. I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what else, what else, what else, where else to go with that. I, but I, 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 Ed is. I, I want to respond to him, to what he's saying because this has to be something you can use as an as a parent, as a, a coworker, as a, a leader in whatever context that you're in. Like we we have to really internalize this. Um, so I'm glad that you brought it up. I'm glad that we're talking about it. And um, I hope that we can translate the developmental language because I think that there really is something there. And I, I, got, I got, I think, what Terry is talking about with the systemat- systemic leader being able to zoom out and zoom in and feel what's going on in the system, but then also act with meta-awareness. Um, so I think it's useful, but there do- it, it does take this translation process and the kind of cultivation of a common language um, to describe the, you know, the realities that we're dealing with. Can I say something? Uh, and listening to you and coming from a place of being a parent and working with setting limits and boundaries, especially through my children, but I've had to set boundaries with other people and people set boundaries with me. I think one of the things I, I, I'm speaking from my perspective, but, if people can't feel the tension of setting a boundary, making a boundary, revising the boundary, if they don't work with that, there's a tension that comes physically, psychologically, inwardly, that a lot of people don't know how to work with. I've been forced to work with it because for whatever reason, um, I can't, I don't know the reason. I just been interested. I want to know what to do with the tension. Maybe it's because I come from a wrestling background and we're always, you know, wrestling with the tension of another very concretely, you know, and trying to flip them over and do this and that. But at the same time, being able to having to zoom out, okay, wait a minute, I fucked up, man. I got beat up because of the way I applied my tension or had lack of awareness of how to work with this very real life arrows of the tension of be, uh, of working with the difference of people if that makes sense boundaries Free. boundaries have ten- uh, yeah thanks thanks, <laughs> thanks. boundaries oh. have t- boundaries have tension in them and i think a lot of times we don't honor the physicality i'm not saying we're just physical but we we've lost touch with the physicality and i think this relates to ed because the physicality is a form of practical what am i doing with my energy which basically is my sexual energy because my physicality is has sexuality in it mm-hmm. I'll chime in, if I may. Uh, I think uh, it's a it's a huge subject when you're talking about development of the human being. So of course you have to start uh, in infancy, and every child learns from the environment that they grow up in, and by by the time they get to school, they've already got some, some habits. Uh, they, 
they know what works for them and, and what doesn't work. And uh, I think most people now, it would be different in different cultures, in, in tribal situations, in uh, poor situations where there's a lot of people living within four walls, uh, a lot of children, maybe even uh, a multi-family situation. Uh, so I'll speak about typical American, let's say a single family situation. I think it's, it's common, Marco's experience. Children, of course, I can't even make that generalization, but I will. Say they don't witness sexual behaviors. Some do, for sure. And, and they learn from that. Uh, but I think most, let's say, middle class uh, children, single family home, the sex is behind closed doors. And they, they find out because they have biological urges uh, and they experiment. And again, if, if, it, if it's pleasurable, if it works, they'll try it again. And, and these boundaries are set amongst the children. I think in your story, Marco, you were lucky, maybe, that, that uh, adults came in and found you experimenting and said, hey, that's not something we do. And so you got a, a uh, negative consequence for your impulse behavior. Um, and I'm going to go back to my childhood, and it's a memory, but I don't know if it's entirely accurate. Uh, but I remember it. My first sexual pleasurable experience was climbing up or sliding down like a flagpole. You felt this pleasurable sensation, but you don't know what it is. Uh, and I think, again, middle class, single, single family with a father and a mother. Uh, in that situation, which is now not the majority of people. The majority of children grow up in not in a two-parent home, even in America. Uh, but anyway, so kids find out about sexuality amongst themselves, playing doctor or whatever. Well, I mean, what about what about the whole you know cultural entertainment industry? I mean, are, you're saying that kids are not exposed to sexuality, but it seems to be everywhere. Well, I think I think now is different from when I grew up. I'm talking about when I grew up, which is like 20 years before when you grew up, when you grew up, there were, there still wasn't the internet and, you know, everything at your fingertips for anybody. Uh, so it's, I'm glad I'm not a parent now. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't know what I would do because I think, I think to be responsible, you have to have, a conversation with your child and they're not capable of understanding, but you have to have that conversation or, or you have to set limits and boundaries and, and it's, yeah, it's like a brave new world. Uh, and, and I think the, the young people today, uh, it's almost like anything goes now you can talk about ethics. The proper thing to do would be to ask permission before you touch, <laughs> you know, before you make some sort of uh, advance. But I don't even know if they do that now. I, I watched a podcast of, of three young 20 something 
women, let's call them women, none of them married, but they all had boyfriends, or there were four, there were four of them, and they, they were stand-up comedians, that was their chosen field, and they talked about uh, their sexual preferences and experimentation, and there were like five levels of intimacy, uh, kissing, fingering, oral sex, and then sex, penetration, intercourse, what we, you know, penetration. And they ranked them as far as their level of intimacy and what they would allow a stranger, a dude they met on whatever, Tinder or, or you know, to do. And they sort of were in agreement that the thing that they, the thing that they would do with a guy would be oral sex. They would do that to them. Second, and this is, those are the least intimate. And then intercourse and uh, kissing, fingering, but a lot of them, fingering was the most intimate. Yeah. So what do you do with, and, and these are 20 something. They're out on their own. Well, some of them, they kind of bounce back and forth between their parents' house and, 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 and they're, they're comedians, stand-up comedians. Uh, but it was, to me, it was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, that wasn't the way it was when I was their age. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a reunion high school and, and, I was talking to one of the girls in the in in crowd, for lack of a you know, one of the popular or the you know cliques and 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 whatnot. And they all, she told me this. They all got together, sleep or whatever, and and made a pact with each other that they were all going to leave high school as virgins, and they kept to it they but they meant they meant sexual intercourse and and they all you know adhered to it and they all came out uh virginity intact uh now they all uh, again i'm just saying it's really tough it's always been tough uh, children, you know, learn by experimentation. It's kind of trial and error. And they don't, there is, you, you can't have a class with a two year old about uh, what's appropriate sexual behavior. If you catch them doing something, then, yeah, there's a, a, a you know, you can handle that in certain ways, but most of it, at least it used to be, goes between the children. They learn trial and error, and, and some behaviors are re rewarded and some are not. And like, like you said now, though, it's so different. So I don't know. I, I don't envy you, Marco, with two young girls. I had two stepdaughters. And, and uh, but that was back in the 70s. That was a long time ago. And, and you know, uh, their mother and I had to work out uh, sort of, you know, rules of which I think they didn't pay any attention to, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and then I had my, you know, I had my own son and, and that was in the 80s. Uh, so, Today, oh my God, I don't know what you do. Good luck. <laughs> I, I, I think talking about stage development, it's, it's almost, Terry, too late 
uh, I, I have a couple people I'm close to uh, with, with doctorate degrees who have worked in the prison system. And, uh, you know, great. Uh, but they're in the prison for a reason. They've committed crimes. <laughs> And, and I, I don't know, we, we, we interact in the real world. Yesterday, I took my car in to get my oil changed. And the people working there, I had a real hard time understanding them. Uh, but you go into a situation and you meet people where they're at. That's what you do. And it works on a transactional basis. In other words, we find common ground cars. And that's what we talk about. And I don't, and, and, and they may be on a higher level than I am when it comes to cars. Uh, but as far as their, their emotional or psychological it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Can they do the job that I'm paying them to do? And the way you figure that out is you meet them where they're at and have a conversation about cars. They could be predators or perverts or God only knows what. They all look like they just came out of prison yesterday. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so... I. I don't know how useful all that higher level stuff is. I mean, it's a very small segment of the population that you're talking about up there. It's not the world we live in. Done. Well, well I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say thank you, Mark. It seems like we're moving up through. We, you know, Marco gave us a anecdote from um, childhood. Now we're talking about teenagers. I have a teen, teen daughter, so 15 years old. So, um, and another, another daughter just about to turn 13. So I'm in the, in the middle of it uh, <laughs> with them. Um, so I'm just noticing that maybe we're kind of now dealing with teens. And at, at, uh, now this may be different. Vancouver is fairly, you know, postmodern. Um, so, you know, they get sex ed in the schools, um, in yeah. At what, when does it start? Elementary school. What, sixth grade, fourth grade? Marco said he was in the second grade. You know <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think that was at the school, but I, you know, I can't remember, but there's definitely, uh, someone who comes in who's well known in our area and does a lot of this work. Um, but certainly in elementary school, I have to ask, maybe find out what's happening at high school. If they're getting some in the planning course. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm a sort of broadly speaking, liberal progressive parent, So I try to be open and talk about it. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I guess uh, no guarantees. Uh, and um, well, it's a whole big topic. And uh, yeah, how, how to work with teenagers on uh, both genders. Um, yeah, I don't want to be a I don't want to be a patriarchal parent. That feels weird. Um, so I'm aware I don't want to do that. Can, you, can so, I ask? Do you have a partner, a wife in the home yeah. with you? So yeah. it's the two of you. So you're it's that typical classical. or normal. Fact, yes. <laughs> <laughs> for better and for worse. Yeah, that's what it is. So, yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about the male, which I guess gets associated with the predatory side. Um, Terry said, what about the women? And, you know, certainly there's not just two um, generally there's two sexes, but there's also, you know, intersex, multiple genders. 
people identify in different ways. People identify yeah, not even as one way, but as fluid. So, it, you know, and, but, I, I, but to Mark's, I think, point, that might be, a, there, there's probably a distribution of that if we were looking at sociographic data. Uh, and in general, at this point in time in our culture, although it's changing, we can talk about men and women and masculine and feminine. And, but so keeping in mind the wider distribution, but, you know, not, not privileging it <laughs> to use maybe, uh, we're, you know, um, charged word uh, unnecessarily or in a, you know, it, just in an inclusive way, an integrative way. How would we bring these different expressions of sex and gender together into this kind of consideration of the reasoning, the ethics, the development, the nurturing, the parenting, uh, and the practical aspects of how we work with these often tense energies, physical energies. I think, can I say something? I think that's a very good direction to go, but I think the hardest thing is working, taking in consideration Terry's moral that whoever we're working with, we have to meet them where they're at. Um, I have several people that I work with that what I would consider for held lightly at different levels of understanding of what we're talking about. I mean, there's some people uh, like Mark says, I have to meet them when they're, where they're at and talking about sexuality and talking about parenting. I mean, some of them are very, that friends of mine are very authoritarian. And I have, I think I, I think you pointed to it, Mark, Marco. Uh, I tried to bring as much presence to just being with them and not getting activated by them because I like to slap the shit out of them. But then what am I doing? <laughs> you know? Um, but I think that's, that's the glitch is I have to own where I'm at and knowing that I can be better, but I also have to work with people that for lack of a better word, just aren't where I am, you know, where I am, but I, I interact with those people and then I have a transaction like Mark says, and it's a day to day thing. I think we do it whether we want to admit it or not. We do it when we go, uh, change our oil or go to the store. I mean, I experience this dealing with people when I go to the store. I can tell by their language that, okay, Mike, <laughs> be aware how you're going to verbalize and interact with them. I mean, that's my practice. That's what I try to bring on a very hands on level, like Ed Tyna tries to point to. Terry, do you work with sex and gender differences in the model? We don't uh, distinguish between that in a particular way. Um, th I've just noticed, though, that uh, in in all of my work through all of these years, I've been a teacher for 55 years now, and so I've taught so many different kinds of people, and uh, I've noticed that, you know, that the, uh, the difference in the way that men might uh, behave in this topic and the way that women behave, and for instance, I noticed particularly when... W I mean, I'm talking about a physical physicality here. And there is uh, something that happens in women when they reach their, oftentimes their 30s. Uh, it's like the uterus becomes the brain. It's like there's a, a, a baby on board wants to happen and they can't really distinguish, you know, uh, and they sometimes are quite irresponsible about getting one, a baby. And, uh, and in that way, it is almost like, to, it seems almost predatory to me because the, uh, the guy really is feeling pretty innocent uh, based on, I mean, now not really knowing what, what, what this woman is or the person with the female body is, 
is experiencing in terms of the 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 um, desire for a child and um, and the person themselves don't actually seem to even understand it it from I mean just this is just observation and I'm, I've just seen uh, uh, enough uh, couples ending up getting roped in together when they might not have been the best partnership in the world because of that impetus of, of the of the woman really just wanting and yearning and just it seems to take over their reasoning or something. Well, I, don't doesn't, have, I don't have any kind of you know, have, have you found, I've just uh, seen it so many times. And it uh, seems and, to me and I have to interrupt. It seems to me that there's a a uh, a mismatch between the drive in men, and it starts right at puberty, where it's just like coming out of their eyes, and that's an apt metaphor. And like you say, with women, it's not so intense until their the biological clock starts to to run down. So you have Males, men, boys, just all they can think about is sex when they're 14, 13, 14, 15. It just dominates them. And that lasts for a, quite a long time. And, but with women, it can just, it, it's, it's different. And yeah, they don't particularly get crazy unless their, you know, their clock is running out and then something happens. And so there's this mismatch with, and without a, a structure around an order, a social order that guides young people and young adults through that, they're just, you know, the guys are crazy when they're 14, 13, 12, the girls are crazy all the time. <laughs> it's just, it's very difficult terrain. And, and our, our, this idea of, of one world planetary consciousness, that's, that's so far out there. People are dealing day to day with these urges, biological urges that they're not capable of dealing with. Maybe, yeah, after, after 50, 60, 70 years on the planet, we got a grip on some things. <laughs> but those, those first, I don't know, 30 years or 40 years, 50 years are tough. They're tough. I want to make it clear. I have absolutely no research on this. It's just pure observation. So I'm not That's saying better. <laughs> better. But I, I've just run into it quite a bit uh, in my family and in other other places. So I just, I mean, there's different different shades. I think to what we call uh, to predation, and uh, um, some of it is biological. I I think, and um, and I just think that it's. Um, it's a part of of human nature in you know of, of all gender orientations in one way or another I, you know i think that, that it can manifest itself in all of them and not just in in men so i just wanted to <laughs> make that point because i i would hate to say that that was you know something well, well the men and not anybody else <laughs> a difference a difference is if a if a older woman uh, gloms on to a younger man for sexual reasons or pleasurable reasons, the young guy, for the most part, goes far out, <laughs> right on. But it's different if an older man is attracted to and, and, uh, 
you know, what's, what's the verb for predation? Uh, and pursue is, aggre- is aggressive, makes aggressive sexual advances on a, on a teenage girl were, uh, were abhorred. But if a 30 something woman, and we've seen this play out in school, in schools, oftentimes, uh, well, often maybe is too big a word sometimes. And it, and it makes the newspapers or, or whatever, but most people go, uh, you know, go lucky guy, <laughs> even though it may screw him up. Right. Yeah. Cause he could be in over his head emotionally. Right. So it's just a tough, it's yeah. a minefield. And I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you do about it. Well, I would hopefully not manage not to blow ourselves up. <laughs> this, <laughs> this minefield. Um. Yeah. I mean, I could say as a therapist, I work in talking about sex and gender. I've worked with, you know, the LGBTQ community. Um, so I do have some experience working with that community. Um, so I try to be, you know, I'm an inclusive therapist that way. I don't know if I can generalize any understandings about it yet. I mean, there's some stuff out there, um, kind of more theory stuff in the integral community. People are writing about it. And, you know, there's a book on integral gender, integral sex and gender studies. and um, some developmental models looking specifically at the line of gender development. Uh, but I guess as a therapist, my goal is just to be, has been to just be as open as I can, uh, supportive as I can to the individual person that I'm working with. Um, and, you know, certainly there's a, there has been a depathologization, not, I mean, with LGBTQ, LGBT, not T, LGB, that's happened already, but the T is slower. <laughs> Transgender has been slower to be accepted. It's more um, because it gets right at that physical level, potentially a physical level. It almost requires being able to, I've found, for me to work with it, I have to actually have the quadrant model. Like I have to be able to differentiate in my mind the physical and the internal part of the person and the social structures that they're dealing with, like the legal piece and the medical piece uh, and their relationships uh, to actually be able to, to work with them effectively because they're experiencing that the internal self is not matching their body on the outside. And that's the disjuncture. Um, so, yeah, I just be a little bit careful of how much I talk about it when it's actual clients that I've seen. I don't want to identify anybody inadvertently or anything. I know this probably that's very unlikely, but I'm always just a little bit aware of that. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't have anything more. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> well, one, one, just maybe one observation or yeah. question. Like when I see a model, whether it's Wilbur's or yours, Terry, um, because it, because of the kind of two dimensionality, just of what you can present, you know, in, in simple terms, whether it's the four quadrants and the, you know, or levels that have to be arranged in a vertical sequence or, with, or matrix in, in, in your case. But I think part of what we've been talking about has been that there's perhaps greater weight that needs to be given to, um, some levels compared to others, because many more people are operating from those structures or, or dynamics, and because within us they're what we most deal with. Um, and of course, developing to construct aware, unitive, illuminative probably reconfigures the whole thing. But um, but in the process, in, insofar as we're on our way there, and not yet there. Uh, it's almost that the the models might trick us into thinking that there's a, a, a I don't know a kind of equality or that the the latter can be really achieved or 
um, is more is as is more important than the quote, quote, quote unquote lower. Is that something that you try to, um, or how do you how, how do you uh, account for that, or or work with it in while working with the model and the limitations of communicating uh, some very complex ideas? Well, one of the things we start out with right away is it, when people question that is we we ask them if they have kids. And then we ask them, uh, you know, if their kids are as mature as they are. They say, no. Are you better than your kids? No. <laughs> you know, I think that you, when you start understanding that, that uh, uh, you know, developmental or have, have a sense that developmental levels grow up all the way through our lifetime and we don't stop developing at the age of 20, which some people tend to think when your body stops developing, so do you. Um, uh, the understanding is that that a whole person, a whole person, is inside a, a baby, um, and and when it grows, it grows like blowing up a balloon. You know, it's not just a vertical thing or a horizontal thing. It grows as a whole, and um, so adults just simply have a as they mature. I mean, the way this is a metaphor for for understanding that a smaller balloon is no better than a, uh, than a bigger balloon or worse than uh, that we all are whole from the very beginning. And yet, you know, there's no parent that would say that their child had the same capacities they have or the same maturity they have. So, um, so we, we try and present it more in that way than we do that uh, something is better than something else. Uh, I mean, I've never felt that I was better than my children. Um, uh, they were perfectly whole and wonderful exactly the way that they are. And yes, I did tell them what to do and I did make them follow the rules and things like that because that, that was my, my job, you know. So uh, You remind yeah. me of my sixth grade teacher, by the way, Miss Chupel. <laughs> we have to deal she, with paradoxes. She told us what to do and she, she demanded our undivided attention. I will always remember that. And... Uh, <laughs> I was a, I was a, uh, a good pupil. <laughs> anyway, that's the way we handle it. Thanks for the question, Marco. I mean, it's an important one. It's a paradox, you know. It really is. Terry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, it seems that part of the distinction, if we work from a developmental level, is understanding functionality of difference, not better. Yes, yes. As a whole. But there is a different functioning going on versus adult and a child. Yeah. And and in order to function at the higher levels, hopefully, you've been blessed with people to help you uh, go to meta or beyond your limitations, you know, from previous stages. Would that be accurate? Well, usually, I mean, we're social beings. There are very few people that are, are totally isolated, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why we want to really make sure that the environment or the context for growing up within a set of social or right. social uh, processes is a healthy one so that, uh, that the people that grow up in those, this is why prisons are so bad. You put all the bad people together and what do they learn, you know? Um, right, right. So this is a, but with the developmental level, is it our developmental model if you were able to put these people in a different environment, then that could affect affect them in a good way? In a good way, and it can also affect them in a not-so-good way. I think about a, a, a study that I did in, with prisoners, um, and uh, many of them scored at a, you know, a third-person perspective, but this one person scored at a 1.5 level. He was at the late first-person perspective. Wow. Um, and... Uh, People at the late person, first person perspective are just learning how to visualize. They don't do it very well yet. Mm. So if you think about uh, learning to talk to yourself on the inside and learning to visualize, and you don't know how to do that very well, uh, that's your memory system, right? Mm -hmm. so if you do something wrong and you've got consequences and your visualization isn't good and you're talking to yourself, uh, your auditory memory isn't good, you don't remember those consequences. So you go back and do it again, and you end up in jail again. Not only that, if you 
Uh, if you think, you know, all two-year-olds think everything belongs to them. Everything is mine. It's all mine. And if that's your attitude as you grow up, uh, because you have had trauma that's so bad that you have, have remained at that stage of development, most judges look for remorse. You go up in front of the ju- judge and you say to the, and the judge says, you know, are you sorry for what you did? And would you be sorry if you took something that wasn't, that was yours, that you only thought was yours? No, yeah, you know, so so no remorse. They get a longer prison sentence. They end up in prison with the when they really, if we could just teach them how to visualize and teach them how to talk to themselves, so that they had a really good memory of consequences, that might help a little bit. So it's Thanks. this kind of developmental stuff that can be useful. And throwing them in prison is not going to help those guys very much. You know, they need to they need to go back to that age and learn how to use their interior senses in a much better fashion. So not, there's yeah. so there's a skill of application that they need help with. Sometimes it is. I'm not saying and, everybody and, does, but some yeah, do. Yeah, but but in in terms of I'm just thinking of using the developmental model in an applied way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If you know that somebody can't visualize, it's automatically understood that if that we better help them learn how. Because if you can't visualize and can't talk to yourself, you don't have a memory. That's where memory resides. Right. And it goes to my experience with my two kids that I actually had to work that with them as they grew from uh, two-year-olds to five-year-olds to nine-year-olds and, right. and onward. and. And the hardest stage for me as a father was working with both my kids, both genders, when they were 9 to 16, because their emotions are all over the freaking place. <laughs> and I'm trying to go, wait a minute, you know. Yeah. And plus, plus not letting my emotional memory from the way I was raised from my parents dictate how I parent them. That's right, because we do hold those memories and respond from those memories. Yeah. And them to be good, healthy memories, not bad. Yeah. Nasty I've memories. told people that actually my children helped me reparent myself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I think that was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it, uh, Derwin, for. Uh, initiating it, uh, Terry for uh, showing up last minute, and um, Michael, Mark, Ed. Uh, Doug was here for a bit, but had to skip off. Um, Derwin, is there anything you'd want to uh, end off with? Well, that's great. Just thanks for to everybody for coming, and Terry, thanks for sharing your model and for showing up with uh, five guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was brave. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation too. I was very rich. I appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Next time. Let's see what right. I'll see. Columbia, England. What do you? Any news, Ed? I don't know. I have to go uh-huh. see what the score is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Later. Later. Bye-bye. Bye.